For centuries, Vienna was ruled by the Habsburg family. They had two luxurious palaces in Vienna. The Schönbrunn Palace, with its expansive ground standing at the edge of town, was their summer residence. Their main palace, the Hofburg, dominates the town center. This imposing and sprawling complex grew with the family empire from the 13th century until just before World War I, when this last new wing opened. While the last Habsburg checked out in 1918, the palace is still plenty busy. It has the offices of the Austrian president, and it's home to hundreds of government workers, the Spanish Riding School, Vienna Boys Choir, and the palace itself welcomes the public. The lavish imperial apartments seem designed to give their royal residence grandeur fit for a god. After all, in the age of divine monarchs, kings and emperors like the Habsburgs claimed God himself ordained them to rule with unquestioned authority. The Habsburgs were one of a handful of royal families who ruled nearly all of Europe until World War I. The walls between the rooms are wide enough to hide servants' corridors. The big, ornate stoves, which servants fed from behind, heated the rooms. The decor is splendid Baroque, the preferred style of divine monarchs as it served as a kind of propaganda to sell the old regime notion that some were born to rule and others were born to be ruled. When the emperor and his extended family sat down to dinner, they ate here. This is the more casual table setting with just your basic silverware. For more formal state dinners, they brought out the golden ware. Each drink came with a proper glass, and spittoons always go on the left. Six centuries of Habsburgs ruled from here, including Maria Theresa in the late 1700s. She was famous for having 16 children and cleverly marrying many of them into Europe's various royal families in order to expand her empire. Today's palace is furnished as it was in the 1800s from the age of Maria's great-great-grandson, Emperor Franz Josef. He ruled for 68 years and was the embodiment of the Habsburg Empire in its final decades. Franz Josef had a stern upbringing that instilled in him a powerful sense of duty. This was Franz Josef in 1915, when he was 85 years old. Wearing his uniform to the very end, he never understood what a dinosaur his monarchy was becoming. And he didn't think it was strange that so few of his subjects actually spoke German. Still, every citizen had the right to meet with the emperor here in the audience room. Famously energetic and dedicated to duty, Franz Josef stood at this tall table to meet with the commoners. They'd come to ask him a favor or tell him thanks for something. Standing kept things moving. On the table, you can read a partial list of 56 appointments he had on January 3, 1910. The emperor presided over cabinet meetings in this room. He ruled the Austro-Hungarian Empire, so Hungarians sat at these meetings. The paintings on the wall show the military defeat of a popular Hungarian uprising. Not too subtle. Franz Josef nurtured an image of being Spartan and a very hard worker. This is his famous no-frills iron bed and portable washstand. While he had a typical emperor's share of mistresses, his dresser was always well-stocked with portraits of his wife, the Empress Elizabeth, or Sissy. Elizabeth, Franz Josef's mysterious, narcissistic, and beautiful wife, is in vogue these days. In the palace, you'll learn of her fairy tale existence, her escapes, dieting mania, and chocolate bills. Sissy's hard-earned, tiny waist was 21 inches around at age 50, after giving birth to four children. Her main goals in life seem to have been preserving her beautiful empress image, maintaining her Barbie doll figure, and tending to her cascading hair. Here in her bedroom, servants worked two hours a day on Sissy's famous hair. She'd exercise on this. Her bathroom was equipped with a huge tub, the finest anywhere, which rested on the first linoleum floor in Vienna, installed in 1888. In spite of severe dieting and fanatic exercise, age took its toll. After turning 30, she allowed no more portraits and was seen in public only behind a gentle fan. 
In 1898, while visiting Geneva in Switzerland, Empress Elizabeth was assassinated by an Italian anarchist. Sissy's often been compared with Princess Diana because of her beauty, her bittersweet life, and her tragic death. When you visit Vienna, it's easy to get caught up in the growing legend of Empress Elizabeth. For maximum imperial Bavarian grandeur, tour the residence. This was the palace of the Wittelsbach family, who ruled Bavaria for more than 700 years. Like so many of Munich's architectural treasures, it was destroyed in World War II and rebuilt since. To meet the Duke, all official guests had to pass through this gallery, lined with 700 years of Wittelsbach portraits. Always trying to substantiate the family claim to power, they included the great Charlemagne as an honorary family member. The paintings are scarred by knife marks. In the final months of World War II, when Allied bombs were imminent, Nazi leaders gave the hasty order to slice each portrait out of its frame and hide them away. The Wittelsbachs were always trying to keep up with the Habsburgs, their Austrian imperial rivals. And this long string of ceremonial rooms was basically all for show. The exuberant decor and furniture is from the 1700s, Rococo. And of course, the Wittelsbach family had their own porcelain made for the palace. With all the mirrors, it's porcelain forever. So you know, the whole palace was really for showing off. And imagine the Duke bringing some of his most noble guests in here with all these miniatures in here. Some even painted with just one hair brushes. That was really a sensation those days. So these were copies of all the great masters. Copies of the best paintings. The palace ballroom was decorated with ancient Roman statues. The Wittelsbachs, like other European royals, collected and displayed busts of emperors, strongly implying a connection between them and the Caesars. The palace treasury shows off a thousand years of Wittelsbach knickknacks and Bavarian regalia, the inspiration for so many fairy tale crowns. Small mobile altars allowed kings to pack light and still have a focus for their worship while on the road. This crucifix, carved from ivory, is exquisite. This reliquary, made in 1640, shows St. George killing the dragon. It sparkles with over 2,000 precious stones. You can almost hear the dragon hissing. It was designed to contain the relics of St. George. The palace also came with a royal garden. Today, it's the realm of everyday people rather than kings, dukes, and counts. Würzburg was the capital of the German state of Franconia. In the 1700s, it was ruled by a prince bishop. He exercised both secular and religious authority, and this grand palace was his home. Opulent as a German Versailles, the prince bishop's residence is the main attraction of Würzburg. Imagine VIP guests arriving for lavish parties. Met here by the Prince Bishop, they'd glide gracefully up this elegant stairway, enjoying a grand fresco as it opens up overhead. Dating from about 1750 and by the Venetian master Tiepolo, it illustrates the greatness of Europe with Würzburg at its center. The hero is the esteemed Prince Bishop, honored by a host of Greek gods affirming his rule. Ringing the room are allegories of the four continents, each with a woman on an animal, and celebrating Würzburg as the center of the civilized world. America, desperately uncivilized, sits naked with feathers in her hair on an alligator, among severed heads and a cannibal barbecue. Africa lounges on a camel in a land of trade and fantasy animals. Asia rides her elephant in the birthplace of Christianity marked by crosses. Europe is the center of high culture, and lady culture herself points her brush not at Rome, but at Würzburg. The adjacent imperial hall is a fine example of Baroque, harmony, symmetry, light, and mirrors. Its ceiling is also by Tiepolo, 
Typical of the Baroque movement, he was a master of three-dimensional illusion, and he'd heightened the illusion with some fun tricks. Notice how 3D legs and other objects dangle out of the 2D frame. The art, like nearly all art of that day, was propaganda, paid for and serving either the state or the church. In this case, it's both. Here, the Holy Roman Emperor bestows upon the Bishop of Franconia the secular title of Prince. The bishop, now the Prince Bishop, touches the Emperor's scepter, performing an oath of loyalty. From this point onward, the Prince Bishop wears two very powerful hats at the same time. A string of splendid rooms evolved from fancy Baroque to fancier Rococo. It all leads to the 18th century mirror cabinet. This was where the Prince Bishop showed off his amazing wealth. It features kilos of gold leaf, lots of exotic Asian influence, and eye-popping extravagance. As for the commoners, we were finally allowed inside this glorious palace about two centuries later. The palaces of the Imperial Habsburg family still create a buzz. The royal family wintered downtown in their Hofburg Palace, and they summered here at the Schönbrunn Palace. Among Europe's grandiose palaces, only Schönbrunn rivals Versailles. It's big, with over 1,400 rooms. But don't worry, only 40 are shown to the public. While the exterior is Baroque, the favored style of divine monarchs in the 17th century, much of the interior was finished under Maria Theresa in Rococo, the frillier let them eat cake style that followed. The chandeliers are either of bohemian crystal or of hand-carved wood shiny with gold leaf. This one was lit by 72 candles. Maria Theresa, who ruled in the late 1700s, was the only woman to officially run the Habsburg Empire in that family's sixth century reign. She was a strong and effective empress, famous as the mother of 16 children, most of whom survived to adulthood. Imagine that the most powerful woman in Europe was either pregnant or had a newborn for over half of her 40-year reign. The original practitioner of Make Love, Not War, Maria Theresa expanded her empire while avoiding wars by cleverly marrying her children into other royal families. During her reign, the rest of Europe recognized Austria as a great power. Her rival, the Prussian emperor, said, when at last the Habsburgs get a great man, it's a woman. In room after luxurious room, the palace heralds the story of a powerful family. Frescoes in the grand ballroom were propaganda. The good life under Maria Theresa. A contemporary of George Washington, but worlds apart politically, she presides like the divine monarch she was over a vast multi-ethnic empire at peace. Tuscany with bottles of good Chianti. The Netherlands with the wild sea. Hungarians with their Magyar hats and animals were all part of her realm in about 1750. There was peace, but only through strength. This fresco shows off her state-of-the-art military. Her infantry moves forward in alternating lines, firing and loading with a horrifying speed and efficiency. A walk through the Imperial Garden, now overrun with commoners, celebrates the evolution of our society from autocracy to democracy. It's been nearly a century since the last emperor checked out. And if access to once-out-of-bounds royal gardens is any measure, the people are doing quite well.